guys, listen, thank you so, so much for, for coming out and uh, agreeing to spend uh, a little bit of time. Uh, hopefully, there'll be some interesting things in here. It's, it's really quite touching to see everybody in this room and everybody bundled out around side. Um, my name's Campbell. I'm from the European city of London, uh, and I work as a product designer on Facebook's Spark AR platform. My team's work focuses on emerging use cases for world-facing AR. I'm going to talk to you today about using our platform, Spark, in designing AR experiences for places and things. I'll be focusing on some of the relevant capabilities that we have today, demonstrated through real-world example use cases. To put it another way, I'm going to be talking about augmented reality experiences where we move beyond just face filters and turn the AR lens onto the world around us. Now, I'm fascinated by AR as a new media surface for engaging with our surroundings, for revealing hidden layers and patterns, spaces that we can make our own or engage with others in. For the purpose of this talk, I want to define augmented reality as this. Media, content, or function bound to an object, a landmark, or an environment. Of course, with so many pieces of technology around us today, there are plenty of historical precedents. Camera luciders, for example, of different forms have allowed artists across hundreds of years to project their surroundings onto their creative media, which is pretty handy if your living relies on accurately recording the world for your patron. Moving a little bit closer in time, uh, my father gets very animated when talking about the head-up display system on the British Royal Navy Buccaneer. This is from 1958. This is crazy. It was, this was designed to help pilots react more quickly to their surroundings by not having to shift their gaze down to an instrumentation and then back up again. And then rolling a little bit closer to today, a little bit closer to time, to the 80s, uh, when I was an entrepreneurial child, dipping my toes into those AR waters, uh, with a technique that was commonplace in film effects, uh, I used to use a sneaky combination of drawn graphics, plate glass, and a 35 mm camera uh, in order to fake photographs of UFOs. Uh, and I used to then sell them to my classmates until I inevitably got busted. Now, today, Spark AR is Facebook's platform for building and distributing and engaging with AR content. It's free to use. And it lets creators build AR content from existing assets that they have, such as graphics, 3D geometry, or audio. And given that mobile will be where augmented reality starts off, it's optimized for mobile, and not just today's high-end devices. Mobile devices are fantastic. Uh, a lot of people have them in their pockets, which means that a real strength of ours lies with distribution. One billion people are using AR experiences on our platform, Facebook and Instagram, since last year. One billion people. I mean, that's, that's quite a number. But that's a very cold, hard stat, and you can't just lean on that. It needs to be about the idea, the concept, the thing that you're making. Distribution will only get you so far. Uh, in one recent user testing session, uh, our friends at Nexus Studio, if, if you're out there, uh, made this gorgeous remark when discussing their experience of using Spark. It's the possibility of doing personal experiences, storytelling that's interactive in a whole different way. No previous digital experience has ever had that. These are all just words. I want to show you a few examples of world-facing AR, starting from the small and working up, from objects to landmarks to environments. One of our engineers, Anna, uh, hey Anna, uh, built this effect to help her remember the ports on an Arduino board 
when she was building a homebrew project. And I love this idea as it plays to the, the notion of a, an AR experience that you would come back to and use more than once. Uh, so running, uh, running in the Instagram camera, I think, maybe this was, or maybe testing, uh, it meant that she could analyze uh, the PCB and check which port was doing what without having to, to refer to some dumb documentation. Next example I want to show you. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I'm from London, uh, and we have these super iconic phone boxes that are scattered everywhere. Uh, they're incredibly popular tourist photo locations. Uh, so Davide, uh, one of our technical artists, and I built in Spark uh, a simple target tracker effect that recognizes a phone box and overlays a scene related to a song about that location. In this case, the werewolves of London. Great. And then at a recent partnership with the Tate Britain uh, and the Mill, hello Mill, uh, saw us explore augmented reality uh, as a means of taking a peek into the hidden social context behind a total of eight paintings in the permanent collection. Visitors uh, are able to use the Instagram camera. If, if you're going to the Tate Britain anytime soon, I urge you to go over there. Uh, use the Instagram camera to launch uh, a single container effect that then you can go off to these eight other paintings, uh, scan those and, and reveal uh, with graphics, with geometry and, uh, and audio narration, some of the secret history behind it. All of those three examples were built using Spark. It's cross-platform, Mac and Windows. Uh, features the tool itself, free to download, a preview application, and the hub, where you can manage the distribution of your effects. Many, many, many capabilities within Spark. I urge you to download it and, and play around. Uh, there are four cornerstones that we see in there that are um, essential to world-facing AR. Uh, they're around tags, around trackers, around the interaction methods themselves, and then the thing that we're calling blocks. So let me just talk a little bit about what those mean. First up with tags, uh, you might have built the most amazing effect in the world, but if your audience can't find it and can't get to it, it's not so good. Um, today, you can uh, custom create these tags within the hub, and those are going to allow your audience to deep link into the effect uh, whenever they open up uh, the Facebook camera. And these, these are custom. These are unique to each effect that goes out. There are then two types of trackers that are you know, pretty essential if you're trying to do things uh, anchored to the real world. Um, the, the first example here is around target tracking. Uh, if you can see in the scene tree uh, in the top left, uh, the target tracker that's in there is pointing to a custom image, a custom target, uh, which when that is located, in this case, our little dancing robot fella is, is pinned to that. Of course, our world is not limited to a square box or a square poster, um, which is why we also have plane tracking. Uh, similar to before, as you see highlighted in the scene tree there, here we just have an instance of a plane tracker um, simple model here that we're using to demonstrate around a piece of, uh, piece of furniture. As a creator, being able to quickly get to a result that you can start tinkering with and iterating is absolutely paramount. And one way we support this uh, is with our model for assigning interactivity to your scene. I don't know if there's any folks in here that used AR Studio, as it was called before. It's called Spark. Back in the day, there's one hand gone up. Uh, but we lent very heavily on, on JavaScript. Um, we still support JavaScript, of course. But today, you can use patches. Patches are super quick. They're powerful. You can drive inter interactivity within your project, ranging from one of those tap behaviors right down to even materials. Fantastic. And then working alongside patches, we also see what we're calling blocks. Now, blocks only came out, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Da, 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 da. Imagine just rewinding a little bit there. Um, 
this is fantastic so that you don't have to remember what patch does what or what command line happens. Of course, we also have an integrated library uh, with patches as they're coming out. Uh, so a few weeks ago, we introduced what we're calling blocks. In this example, we have a really, really quick setup for getting objects into world scenes as quick as just a drag and drop, and that's it. Um, if you want to get in and start to peek underneath the hood as to how that block might work, you can get in and you can edit that, which will then open it as a new project. So think of those as little collections of, of interactivity and, and assets. They're really going to help you start uh, getting motoring really, really quick with building your projects out. Importantly as well, both patches and blocks can be shared with other creators. So we have a fantastic, thriving creator community who are making these little items and then sharing them out uh, with folks to get up and running. I've talked around some cornerstone capabilities for world-facing AR. And I now want to take a step back from that view. I want to talk about what can help make for compelling AR experiences. Simply, and sorry, there isn't some kind of magic answer for this, but we have to address human needs. I feel we need to be mindful of three human-centered qualities when building augmented reality experiences for the world. The first is around being familiar. Do I understand, as a user, how to start engaging with this experience? So important. Secondly, it's about being timely. For example, are the right controls afforded to me at the right time? Is the AR experience presented to me at a time when it's going to be of most use? Which brings me on to the third principle, which is around actually being useful. You know, be, really test yourself when you're designing and you're building these things. Does this actually solve a need that users might have? And is AR actually the most appropriate medium? I find this notion around how appropriate might AR be, be used for tasks absolutely fascinating, because uh, I, I, I have a hunch that most folks in this room here adore technology and want to use it at a kind of any chance. Um, I remember when this fantastic camera came out, and I'm sure you, you all recognize this. And for me, this is a great lesson in the technology itself is not the means to an end, right? When this came out, and very, very quickly, there were open frameworks uh, that allow people, allowed people, including myself, to build software using the camera as a controller. Did anybody here do, do this when it came out? Again, a few more hands. This is great. In some ways, though, it was no different from plugging in a mouse. It didn't magically identify and solve a user need. Again, the technology itself isn't the means to an end. So while Spark AR can do all of these things, it can build, it can iterate and test, it can allow you to publish to Facebook and to Instagram, and it can then let you distribute we all still need to work together to identify what those real, meaningful user needs are going to be. If augmented reality is to be pervasive, then building, exploring, and playing is what will pave the way for truly memorable and delightful AR experiences. So the next time you consider what is the answer to how augmented reality will be used, I want you to remember this, a quote from the writer and philosopher Susan Sontag, uh, who once said, the only interesting answers are those which destroy the questions. Thank you very, very much, everyone here, uh, for taking the time to listen to this talk. If you've got any questions, I'd love to have a chat. Uh, so do come and find me at the speaker pavilion later on from three. And both uh, Matt Hansen and Dan Moller from Spark will also be there too. Um, before you rush over there, make sure you hang around here for Dan's talk that's going to be starting on the stage shortly.
Thank you very much.